Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Reinsurance Podcast. I'm your host, co-host, Jared Lee. Well, host now. Oh, geez. Well, I've promoted been, myself. You're going to find me on the, on the podcast. <laughs> it's going to be a really awkward podcast for everybody listening. Is it the, is it the shirt? I haven't mm. tried this color before. <laughs> it fits you great, though. Yeah. Uh, extra small. <laughs> anyway, I am your co-host, Ben Rose. And, well, it's, uh, it's still a... here, clinging on. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a numerical size shirt with Lacoste, don't you? So this is going to be like a, a one. Oh, you're familiar. Yeah. Actually, I think uh -huh. this one might be a, a two, and I couldn't quite work out what that meant. Oh, yeah. No, this is a, Yeah, I don't know. It's the worst. Everything has a letter that... that or a number, you mean. Is, is, a, is it part of a word, which is a size? Yeah. And then some just give me numbers. I'm not... Our, our partners would laugh at us. They'd be like, this is how clothes work. <laughs> but for us, I shop in small, medium, large yeah. sizes. <laughs> Having grown up with letters. <laughs> but we digress. We do. Well, <laughs> what are we talking about today, Jared? Today we are going to dive into a day in the life of a reinsurance broker. <gasps> so we spent some time with, with your background diving into what does it look like for underwriters, um, specific, specifically at Lloyd's. Um, today we'll dive a little bit into what that experience might look like on the broking side. Um, we were encouraged. We recently received an email sort of saying a bunch of young people in the industry like learn about the space from us. Or even people not from the industry yeah. who want to get into the space. Which is cool. Yeah. So with that in mind, this is a what a reinsurance broker looks like. So come along, young Padawan, and we will we shall tell you a story. Um, Indeed. First, so so I started my career um, in the U.S., but when I moved to London, I joined a, a reinsurance broking team at at Aon at the time. Um, and so we'll we'll touch a bit on those experiences a, a bit. But can I ask you a weird question? Yeah, first? out of the gates, let's go. Okay, so it's a, <laughs> so a reinsurance broker, and you do reinsurance broking. So what what verb is this? Broke to broke to break. What what is it in the past tense? I think I, you I broke the deal yesterday. I don't think there's a consensus on this, to be honest. Um, I think you would, fr I would have always framed it as like the deal we, yeah, we broke or brokered, I think is a common one. Yeah. So you, oh, you you're, placed it. You're broke. Yeah. Then you, that's, yeah. <laughs> the escape. Just so you shift it to yeah. like, this is placed now, I'm placing this deal. Um, but I think broking is my preferred over brokering, which, but uh, there are, geographies that that phrase it that way so um for the young listeners like don't back me with what i say here this might differ from where you go okay. uh, i did think about doing it at some point in an article it's, it's just called reinsurance is broke <laughs> or something but it sounds interesting yeah. anyway we you were saying yeah. um but I, I think on the whole this is a really really interesting job um one of the things similarly to the underwriters when they come in and and, and Jonathan Kimber spoke about this when he was on the podcast. But when you first sort of come into the industry and then you get a look at the reinsurance side of it, whether you're on the broking side or on the underwriting side, the sheer complexity and nuance and creativity around it is actually really fascinating. So if you've come over or you've looked at the industry from I'm selling car insurance or I try to you know buy insurance for this big commercial building, it, it's very sort of maybe simple is the wrong word, but it feels more vanilla. But when you look at your client is an insurance company and they're trying to buy these complex programs of, of their own insurance, the sheer complexity of it, it becomes a very fascinating sort of problem to wrestle with. Um, I won't say, I won't use the tedious cliche of it's a different job every day because that's always crap. And in renewal seasons, it's oftentimes the same as last renewal season. <laughs> um, so I would say it's a, it's a very interesting and different role, 235 days a year. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you're, you're presented oftentimes with very complex client challenges where an insurance company is trying to think about a new class or new line of business or optimizing their revenue or their income. And there's all manner of ways that they can do this. And there's no like specific, like the correct answer. And when you say a client here, just for our, our newer listeners, yeah. what, what is a, a reinsurance broker's client typically? Yeah, so the, the reinsurance broker's client is the insurance company or the sedent. Um, so that 
um, in, most traditionally, you have retro brokers whose clients are reinsurers buying their reinsurance, as we've discussed. Um, and sometimes FAC brokers bleed more into having conversations with both the insurance company and the, the big commercial client that they're protecting there. But on the whole, you could treat the client as the insurance company. Um, but it almost always starts out with a review of what that client's book of business looks like and what they're trying to achieve, oftentimes looking at financial results or similar and saying, okay, what do you, where do you want this business to, business to go? What are we trying to protect against? And then thinking about reinsurance as part of that equation. It's not the whole equation, but it's a, a really important piece of it. Um, so a huge amount of time is spent doing work like that, arranging different structures and ideas, but always centered around trying to understand and solve for that client's underlying challenges. It's interesting, isn't it? Because we think about from an underwriter perspective, you, you only really see the brokers where, like, again, it's not completely true, but stereotypically, yeah. you only really see the brokers during the renewal season. And when they're not there, you sort of sit and go, huh, yeah. no brokers around, I guess I'll yeah. just sit at my desk and wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, but think... the brokers are busy when they're not with the underwriters, right? They're off yeah. with the clients, they're helping them think about their portfolios, as you said. Yeah, and, and doing huge amounts of assessment and evaluation of, of things like behind the scenes, like running all manner of different models and, and evaluating kind of what can work. Again, every broking firm might be different. The firms, that, the teams that I was on and, and things might operate very differently than, than other business units and things. But um, I think the other stereotype that you see is it's very chatty. It's kind mm. of salesman -y, It's this, and there there is an element of that, of course. Um, but you're, they're very much like a partner problem solver. I think one of the reasons that both of us believe so um, with such conviction that the role of the broker will remain prominent in our industry is because the sort of significant amount of value add that this this sort of function and role delivers into the industry right it's not just a you know i'll sort of use cars salesman -y to to the to the underwriters but it's much more technical oftentimes I, I agree i think there's almost a perception especially when you come into the industry if you're not going in directly into breaking or underwriting or you're finding out about it that you're your career path is predetermined based on your your star sign, almost like your, <laughs> yeah. you know, when you're an ant that emerges, like in one of the films that yeah. is animated. I, I think you're either nice. is it ants or a bug's life because they both have ants in. You know where I'm going with this, I do. But it's like you're either a worker ant or a soldier ant, yeah. depending on if <laughs> you're <laughs> Sagittarius or yeah, whatever. Um, and, and it does always seem to come down to that sort of like, oh, well, if you're really outgoing and you like talking to people and persuading people, you should be a broker. And if you're really analyst, analytical and very introvert and, and whatever else, then you should clearly be an underwriter. And it's this tug of war between the persuasive broker going, come on, give us some yeah. some capacity and the underwriter going, no, no, no. <laughs> and, and, and that's sort of the, the imagination a lot of us have. But yeah. behind the scenes, and especially more and more, now we had the the Howden Analytics folks on the podcast the other day talking about how analytics is everyone's job now. Yeah, I really, if you're an introverted uh, and very analytically minded person, you're at home in a broking house as much as in an underwriting house. Yeah, I um, and and if you're an outgoing underwriter, that can only help as well. Yeah, I think that will have changed over time I, I certainly suspect that you know 15 or 20 years ago it, those when, when there was no data <laughs> <laughs> right i think in in that era you certainly would have had more of and this is probably where the stereotypes originated from because they would have had a, some sort of base and truth at some point but you're right the role is becoming much more sophisticated much more technical now um if you're if you're broking or brokering to be determined or breaking but but if you're broking um catastrophe risk uh, with a for a client so a client with japanese her uh windstorm or quake or if you're broking u.s hurricane or quake um you're going to be very familiar with your cap modeling solutions and your return period targets and and what type of structures will give your client the best protection for those things, how to optimize for reinstatements on casualty programs, these types of things. Because it's 
it becomes it's becoming more and more around like the raw underlying numbers of of what the book you're looking at is there's always going to be an element of trying to broke net new i think cyber is kind of in this space where we don't quite know what big losses might look like we don't quite know how books will evolve but in all the core classes that we've sort of had a, a couple of decade couple of decades of business on there's certainly a lot more sophistication with how they assess and analyze those solutions absolutely and i think as well as that we've had a, a series of sizable events mm -hmm. uh, over the past decade that each time they've happened have left somebody looking a bit silly where they've under or over the bought their reinsurance coverage as the sedent yeah. and then in turn they've been able to go to their brokers a bit and kind of say oh you know you didn't really advise us to buy the right thing here you said it would be great to yeah. create this giant multi-tower thing that triggered but it didn't protect us from all this attrition and now yeah. we're it's drowning in claims or whatever it might be um but really that that advisory role in terms of what to buy as you said is, is where a lot of that technicality is coming on right because you're mm -hmm. you're not just trying to help the client think about their exposures and how their portfolio might be affected but they're trying to think about how their coverage or a, a whole range of options of coverage might perform yeah and one of the things we've talked about on this show in the past is typically because there's so much admin in the industry the brokers actually don't have time to do that really important second part of exploring different options with their clients. It becomes more of a, well, really busy. Do you mind if we just renew what we did last year and hope that there, there are no events yeah. <laughs> or no big loss, <laughs> losses because yeah, I don't know if we're going to be able to get it placed if we go out and try you know, this top and drop or this other thing that we've yeah. been talking about. There's been, um, and when we think about Again, a, a, a position that's sort of held that we've always pushed back on is this idea that reinsurance isn't innovative, partly because innovative, even if you're an American, um, but partly because technology hasn't sort of swooped in and transformed in the same way. But I think there's a huge amount of innovation when you think about how brokers structure and organize deals and um, program structures or towers where you have um, numerous layers that reinstate at different times and um, you have p towers that sort of inure to each other they cascade in different scenarios or there's second and third st reinstatement structures that will evolve with second and third event cover type things and and it's again originating from this centralized piece of what is the client really solving for and then most of the big firms are investing really heavily in technology that's going, that allows them to sort of, as you were sort of alluding to, run a number of different scenarios, build a, different, a few different towers, pile on all, what if it's this, what if it's that, what if it's this, um, and then assess the performance of those various program models with um, the numbers off the back of that and then present those to their clients. So there's a lot of, of innovation that's happening there, but you're exactly right. When you, when you think about the beginning of a renewal season, we're not doing anything exciting and fun anymore. The client has given us sort of a, a zip file full, full of spreadsheets and we're sort of stripping all that data down, trying to help cleanse the border row and organize the basic exhibits and all this stuff. And so much time gets spent doing that work that actually by the time we're, that's in, 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 in shape, you're left with a much tighter window to then perform this analysis to so a lot of that thing the gets, same for the underwriters right, yeah. as well because then you're like well oh, can you look at these three different options for my client and they're like no because i'm still sifting yeah. through all this data i've got time to go through your data once and then i've got to look at my other client i can't manipulate it for everyone and then also run three different versions of yeah. my, my modeling software because yeah. i have to type the data in every time i use my modeling software as well yeah <laughs> exactly and and i think this is a lot of this work then gets pushed to sort of after renewals where okay now we've done all that all that hard work is done those deals are now closed or bound let's take a look back and say okay what if we had done those things what if and the owners have a bit more time but even as you've said they might do that for a couple favorite clients but they're not going to rerun three different programs for 40 clients that they have a small relationship with there's just not enough time to do it so if if we can improve how the data gets flowed flows through if we can improve how structures get analyzed and send that to tools that be like yeah send us 11 programs i don't care 
we'll price them all in the next half hour and send you back what we think. Like if we can get to that world, which I don't think we're very far from at all, I think it's going to unlock a huge amount of creativity as as brokers and underwriters begin to sort of really stress test various options and and I think to the benefit of the end client at the end of the day. And and just to give an idea to listeners of how complex these structures can be that you put together as a broker, mm-hmm. I could you tell us a little bit about the kind of clients you would work with when you were breaking and the scale of the deals, the number of participants involved, the number of, yeah. of layers and things like what, what sort of thing were you coming up against? Yeah. So I, I worked on, um, Japanese business, which is, um, usually fairly sophisticated, but I think some of the American structures get more complicated still. And I'll touch on that in a second. Um, what you'd normally see is, um, quite sizable, usually single towers, um, where you'd have the the main retention, and then a number of different layers that stacked on top of that. But what you'd then also see is nuance where certain layers in a program, so, so most of the big clients will buy both um, wind and quake coverage. And then at certain layers, both of those perils will be covered, and other layers would just be a single peril. So again, based on what types of events have happened, the program will behave differently. And then you got what's called verticalization, which happens quite a lot in the, bit, the really big clients which is when certain reinsurers give you slightly different terms for their share. And they do so because they really want to win that client and they're happy to take a slightly cheaper price to get a slightly bigger share because they're trying to build a relationship and and similar. So we saw a lot of that happening. And how did you manage that as a broker, I guess? Yeah, (laughs) this is where where the the less exciting part of the job always comes in. I had built this huge spreadsheet out that that keeps track of all the various layers and the sub layers and responses to stuff. And um, it was very clever because it would change colors because I use conditional formatting. Uh, (laughs) But oftentimes you're right, you have, and so for these really big programs, um, easily 50, sometimes 75 reinsurers on the panel across the whole program. So huge. Yeah, how many layers as well? Um, so when I was on it, five or six layers. And then of those 75 reinsurers, um, not all of them are on, are on all the layers. So you have um, up to, I guess, like 375 yeah. different lines. Yeah, being put yeah, down. yeah, yeah. Right. And, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then verticalization gets nuanced because let's say everyone is on the same terms for layer one, but there's five different terms for layer two and there's three different terms for layer three and seven different terms for layer four. So it's, it's, it's not a, everyone got 25%. That's, that's that deal done. It's, it's, it's very, very nuanced. And, and when you're trying to keep track of all this, it's, it's, it's sort of very much, are you good at managing all the tasks at I, once and keeping an eye on it. And I guess that happens not just when you're trying to get a deal placed, because we, we always think about the deal making part, mm-hmm. you know, the placing of the deal, but I guess afterwards as well, there's a lot of client management you need to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's getting an understanding of one, it, once the deal is done, getting all the contracting done. So mm-hmm. then it's all the different, all the different contracts will have different numbers on them. Again, based on how you've structured the program, but everyone has to get their own thing. You're sort of tracking this, um, who's received what? I think this might have changed now, but up in when I was still there, some of the clients would require what were called like wet stamps or wet signatures. So what that means for the uninitiated is that they were from London because it's always raining in London. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but the client actually required every single line that an underwriter gave them to be like the original signed line that the underwriter actually put their pen on that piece of paper. Um, so what the broker would do is they'd actually have all the underwriters mail them in. So as we're preparing the final documentation, we'd be waiting for three more clients. And because these are global deals, right, we're waiting for paper to come from America, paper to come from Asia, paper to come from across Europe. And how big are these contracts as well? Um, usually the core contract, 40 to 50 pages, and then you'd have 60, signing 70 pages. signing pages. Yeah. But then the, the funny thing is with this, because I'm, I'm quite pedantic with, with certain things that annoy me for no reason. One of the things that annoyed me for no reason is paper shape. Ooh. So American pa- Americans oh. don't use A4. 
So if you have an A4 contract, Amer- American paper. Stop the podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hang on. America doesn't use A4 They don't paper. use A4. So it, it's, it's slightly shorter and slightly wider, the paper style. I've, how have I never noticed this? I've, I've been to America yeah, many no, times. No, if you're just looking but, at a, a stack of paper, you yeah. would never notice. But if you go to a shop and you get them side by side, they are different. But when you have Goodness to give a client me. the originals of the document, so now you've got you've got this massive stack of paper, but some of the pages just stick out from the edge, and it's not. It just drove me nuts. But this is just the way it is. I, 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 I'm still <laughs> flabbergasted. Is the word Next on the Dunder Mifflin podcast. <laughs> yeah. Goodness me. Yeah. So stuff like this would happen. I, I used an A4 piece of paper to measure a table the other day, so I didn't have a. Yeah, a tape measure, and so I just worked out how many A4 pieces of paper it was. And then I knew how long an A4 piece of paper was. Did you have Siri convert that for you? Uh, what to American paper? Because yeah. <laughs> Siri doesn't know how big our paper is. No, exactly. Go back to California, Siri. <laughs> yeah, <You> hippie. <laughs> uh, um, but so there was this always this process there of this is super super manual, and you're checking this all off. Um, Again, all this is done on email, so you'd have, you'd ask like one question. You have like hundreds of emails every day. So this is during a renewal season. There's huge amounts of like administrative work of like tracking everything and keeping it all there, which again consumes, you know, what's happened. And if you have people, you know, colleagues working on deals together, the fact that someone's emailed me an update, but you're working on the deal and you're chasing something and you didn't get CC'd on that email. Mm. You're chasing things that have already been done now, and so everyone tries to build trackers of sort. Like it's, and then you're annoying clients, and yeah, so annoying a reinsurers. It's like somebody already asked me that. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of this kind of stuff that can happen during the renewal season, which is quite the the chaos in the busy season of for a broker. Um, so there's definitely things that are amazing and Just things that are room for improvement. And that, that's interesting, isn't it? So because of this risk of getting missed off CCs and not having a centralized administration mm. system and people all tracking things in their own Excel spreadsheets. Does that force co-location for breaking teams and mean that remote working is much harder? I, th- I think so. Um, I, I, anecdotally, I'd heard a lot of broking teams felt more pain during the pandemic mm. because it, it was a lot more of that Less, less hearing, less of you sort of getting the quick update or them sort of shouting over the desk at you. Um, in in London, as many people might know, that it's much more open floor plan. So there's a huge amount of collaboration between teams that sort of sit near each other. Um, the states, I think, is a bit more still. Um, so maybe maybe it didn't impact those teams as much, who are a bit more isolated. But I know the London market, especially, um, that kind of collaboration as to where stuff sits. Um, what's happening on things is 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 much more effective when people are co-located. Um, but yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see how this moves forward. I, I think we're seeing the steps towards some of these things going away. I think there's been a, a real commitment to people wanting to trade electronically. Even during the pandemic, people sort of happy to say, we're not, we don't need wet signatures anymore. You can just sign us an electronic version of things. Like all of that is beginning to move there. But you know, when we talk about what we do on the broking part of our tool, the placement platform that, that Superseed has, it's aimed at leaning into all of that really tedious, painful part of the job. Because again, going back to the other piece with the data, if we can make that more effective, more time is spent actually having valuable conversations with their underwriting colleagues or partners. More time with clients about what updates are happening, what the feedback from the market might be, less sort of chasing around when during a renewal season again for aspiring brokers who listen um you will certainly be in the office till 10 11 o'clock at night for many of those days um we have friends in the industry who work christmas eve one you know and new year's eve who do big one one deals like you're trying to get everything over the line at the end of the day if, it, if it's inefficient how that happens it it means that it's eight forty five on christmas and you're still chasing emails or it's 11 at on new year's eve and, and you're stuck kind of hovering over your phone or with your laptop open it's like a reinsurance version of santa trying to get around everyone's rooftop yeah. manually <laughs> we know santa's got super santa loves paper as well he's got a bunch <laughs> of letters oh yeah that's true 
Mm. Um, but yeah, so that's, I think it, for those who are interested in broking, it's a really, really exciting and fun career. And you travel, you get to travel and see clients. It's it's very engaging. Do, do you get involved in, in claims as well? Like, a, Is there a, a claims broking element or trying to work out who's on what? There, there is a claims broking element. Um, it's, you, it's oftentimes a different team, mm. not always. Um, but I know there was a firm as large as Aon will have a different team for certain accounts that yeah. does it. I'm sure smaller firms have the same people. Mm. Um, claims broking is really interesting because so oftentimes, this going back mm. to sort of the news with, with B3I. The challenge with reinsurance is a huge amount of gray area. We've talked in earlier podcasts about like 9-11 and things. One of the things that the claims brokers have the responsibility for is convincing the sort of lead reinsurers that you are in fact on this risk. Sometimes it's obvious and there's no sort of getting away from it. But there's other times where it's you're looking at it going, they should pay for this, but they could probably try to get out of it. And how do we have this conversation mm -hmm. that that leverages the the long-standing relationship with a client or similar that that gets that claims process like agreed and signed off to, to go through but there is certainly a claims broking as a a role as well fascinating mm. well guess what jared oh here we go it's time to play a new game oh because we used to have price it yeah well, we still have price it yeah but as we're doing a broker focused episode we're going to use that verb that we struggled to identify at the beginning, <laughs> and we're going to play Broke It. Let's do it. Which sounds like a game, Bop It. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is not an advert for Bop It. But, no. Uh, anyway, Broke It, however, it is a big advert for. So let's get started. So you mentioned you worked on Japanese business. Mm. Uh, catastrophes there have been quite uh, challenging for events in particular over the last few years. You know, we had the Rugby World Cup almost cancelled because of a, a typhoon or, or several games, I think it was. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the Olympic Games postponed and eventually held uh, following the pandemic. So I'm going to invent another huge worldwide event that everyone's very excited about, which is going to be like a mega gaming Olympics for people with Nintendos and, mm -hmm. and Sony playstations and xboxes and, and all this sort of stuff yeah there's a thing right yeah, this, yeah. what's it called there's esports esports yeah. there we are thank you i was couldn't think of that on the train <laughs> here i was like this definitely has a category name anyway world's largest esports tournament attracting people from all over the world being held across 18 different stadium style venues with all the latest gadgetry to put yeah. these players performances up on screens uh, and in holograms and all sorts of other things that haven't fully been invented yet i how are you going to broke it to a market of global underwriters who are yeah. willing to take on this risk? It, it's, a, it's a really interesting way to sort of case, and similar to the price it game, I think what you want to do is think about how you're understanding like the sort because the first thing you want to do is understand what the client's trying to cover, right? Obviously, the Olympics is an easy example is there's ticket prices and merchandise costs and and all manner of value that's lost with advertisers going like they they have a i've never broke those deals but you have a, a huge array of like if this gets canceled here's the economic impact of that um whether it's refunds or it's like all of this stuff they've they've quantified that so the first step would be truly quantifying okay how much revenue is this going to generate? How does this sit? What are the, all the sort of adjacent risks that sort of fall under the umbrella of this massive event? Um, and then, and then, what you're going to try to do is spend some time understanding what are all the potential exposures that could cause these things, whether it's hackers or power outages or a, a massive storm. Because one of the things we've didn't, we didn't touch on, but um, a big chunk of the broker's role is working with the contracts team to ensure that all of these various things actually get covered. So you'd have different clauses that say, well, if it's a cyber attack, it's this, or if it's, a, a, if you think about catastrophes, it's like, is it a named peril? Mm -hmm. It can't just be like, oh, the wind blew and my roof came off. It's like, yeah, but was it, did it get a name? Was it like Hurricane Andrew? Did it get, you know, was it, did it hit a certain size? Um, same thing with quakes. They'll have like a hit a certain point and I'm, I'm, uh, the metrics, no, the, you know it. What's it? Yeah, the scale. Someone's the, the shouting. Scale. Someone's shouting into their the Richter <laughs> scale. The Richter scale. That's the one. Thank you for shouting into your <laughs> into your headphones, podcast listener. Um, 
but you have these sort of, so you do the same kind of exercise. You go, okay, what are all the things that can happen? And then you begin to sort of assess what's the likelihood of all those various things. Um, Solar storm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you, you'd introduce, or you'd introduce like, or all other perils or something similar. But, and then you begin to look at the likelihood of all those various scenarios and assess to some degree is is that likely to cause like a total loss or a partial loss and kind of what degree of loss would each of those things cover for and then you get a sense of kind of what amount of protection you're trying to think about from there what you're going to do is trying to get a cl- an understanding of the client's risk appetite do they want to retain a huge amount of money do they want to sort of offload as much as possible but they're happy to pay more premium do like what is where do they sort of sit what are they comfortable comfortable with um, from there, then the harder thing begins to happen, which is like, okay, we have an idea of what we're trying to place. Who do we know who might write this? Something like this, you're looking at underwriters who you know like to write cyber, who might like to write event cover. You're trying to sort of pattern match a little bit there. But net new risks are really tricky because it's it's harder for the underwriter, one, to assess it, but two, it's harder for the broker to know who they should go to. Um, again, something we think about and how we solve f- for clients of ours. But, you know, how do we make it easier for that underwriter who's sitting in Sydney right now to be like, see that risk and know that that's something they'll be interested in looking at and and connect those parties? And I, I guess I asked somewhat ambiguously there as to whether this was an insurance or a reinsurance risk. Because I, I mm. could have positioned it as either I. Uh, you're, you know, I'm the client who wants you to go and break yeah. this deal. As I'm the esports event person, yep. company that's staging this whole event, or I could actually be an insurer that has insured one of those perils you mentioned, or several of those perils you mentioned. And actually, I might say, yeah, the client really wanted me to take all of the perils, yeah. <laughs> you know, as part of this esports tournament. But actually, I'm really uncomfortable with the tsunami piece of this peril, yeah. or with the, you know, the terrorism part of this peril. So can you take some of my risk away? And I guess that's when the reinsurance broker would come in and, and as you say, try and find, as you said, you know, maybe somebody to take the cyber peril away because oh. I, I wanted to keep my client happy as the insurer. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to turn away that business. Well, yeah, and this is this is a way a, a lot of FAC originates. The underlying, the original insured, original insurer sort of writes a, an entire risk for a, a client or someone that they really want to, to have on their as, uh, in on their books and then goes, but I don't want to write, I don't want this, you know, typhoon risk on my, on my book. So I'll offload parts of this. It's, it's certainly something that's common. And if that, that direct approach is going to be easier for the reinsurance broker, partly because more often than not, they're going to have a better idea of who that will, where that will go. And, and oftentimes it might be on either a a hundred percent session basis where that client that insurer says i don't want any of this give it to somebody else and then you're saying here's what it looks like um or on a quota share basis that says i i only want 10 percent of this so someone can take the other 90 and you're so you know what you're insuring and you have a very clear understanding of what that underlying cost to premium might look like or i guess you could even have a scenario where as the reinsurance broker you've You've already negotiated with this insurance company that's insuring this esports event that that insurer can insure as many events as they want yep. throughout the year or up to a certain limit. And for each one of those events that they insure, X proportion or above certain limit of that event coverage will be then reinsured as part of a treaty yep. as well. Again, it's incredibly bespoke and custom yeah. every time, right? It could be pass, passed on in all sorts of different ways. Yeah. Yeah. It it never ends, right? It's it's all a a game of how much of this risk do you want, and if you don't want all of it, like who else can take it? And that continues until everyone has what they want, and no one is trying to get rid of anything else. So, but that's a, I'm looking forward to more of these. That was a good one, indeed. It's a shame to stop the clock, but we are running tight on time. You'll have to wait for another episode of the Reinsurance Podcast. <laughs> We're finishing each other's sentences. <laughs> See you next time. Bye, everyone.